Okay, so next we have Michael Bretti uh, from Applied Iron Systems. Um, so Michael's got a really interesting presentation because it combines two things I think are really cool, propulsion and testing. Um, and um, so his current role is uh, leading the first open source electric propulsion program. Um, but as well as that, he's also developing some open source testing capabilities as well. So he's, out of necessity, he's developing the tools that are going to verify and validate his designs. So uh, I'll be grateful to hear all about that. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about a couple of uh, advanced vacuum testing infrastructure systems I'm going to be developing um, in conjunction with the open source uh, plasma and ion thrusters that I'm working on. Um, so these two systems are a micro TVAC uh, system for my vacuum chamber as well as Exceda, which is a personal uh, accelerator that I'm building that can be used for radiation dosing. Uh, so a quick overview, uh, advanced high vacuum uh, testing infrastructure for, infrastructure for space applications is often extremely costly and highly specialized. Uh, you're talking many tens of thousands of dollars uh, for thermal vacuum or radiation dosing, very large complex facilities. Um, for, at least for my purposes, and I think for a lot of uh, systems that are being developed in the open source community uh, at the smaller scale, uh, this really isn't all that required. Um, especially like for the thrusters that I'm developing, they're very small and compact. And my goal is to miniaturize and simplify these technologies using uh, standard off-the-shelf modular systems, um, employing standard hardware as well as simplified in-house built systems. And really to demonstrate this feasibility, um, I'm just gonna be building it at home and showing that it can be done uh, with very limited resources and open sourcing everything. Um, so a little bit of background first. Uh, this is the micro propulsion testing chamber that I'm actually currently using. So both systems are going to be interfa interface with this. Um, so it's based off a of six inch conflat hardware, which for the European standard is uh, CF100. Um, it has two inputs. So on the right side, you have the input for the propulsion system. On the left side, you have whatever instrumentation or other systems you use complementary for it. Uh, there's a port for vacuum gauge, and there's also a large view port for actually viewing the thrusters in operation. Um, so this system was optimized for rapid pumping speeds. I use a 600 liter per second diffusion pump, and uh, I can get down to one times 10 to the minus five tor in less than an hour from atmosphere. Um, so it's very good for very fast and rapid uh, changes during testing. Um, so you can actually find all of the calculations and the simulations for this system on my website. Um, so this is actually my, my system uh, currently in the basement. Um, so this is the high vacuum chamber that has the high vacuum pump, the roughing pump, and the cooling system associated with the diffusion pump. So TVAC, uh, as, as you probably are all, all aware, um, thermal vacuum is essentially cycling uh, hardware at low and high temperatures um, to simulate kind of space environments, usually plus minus 50 C, but that can vary depending on the mission uh, parameters. And these usually require huge, complex uh, testing facilities, often chambers big enough that you can walk into um, with very complex uh, cryogenic shrouds and everything. Um, for my system, I'm looking to go as dirt simple and as cheap and as, uh, as possible um, using just very standard basic hardware. Um, so this is the concept for my uh, thermal shroud system. So it's based off of actually, uh, for anyone who's just uh, familiar with vacuum systems, uh, a Meissner trap. Um, so this is just a coil of copper tubing um, that you would flow your uh, cryogenic fluid through, so liquid nitrogen, uh, to create kind of the cold environment. Uh, at the ends, there would be a couple of plates that are brazed to hold in place um, some quartz heaters, which would be used for the heating cycle. So this way you can get both hot and cold cycling in a very compact form factor. This whole system would actually slide directly over the thruster, which I'll show in a couple of slides, um, that allow me to do direct testing of the thruster while simultaneously uh, cycling it. So one of the issues with uh, TVAC is that it requires a lot of inputs. You need cryogenic input, you need heater power, you need sensors for uh, determining temperature. Um, all this can be greatly compactified and simplified. Um, this is uh, a simple setup using all common off-the-shelf components. Uh, this is a two and three-quarter inch conflat 
uh, cross. So for the European standard, it's CF40. Um, this, this cross piece itself can be bought for like $100 at any you know, general high vacuum uh, supplier. Um, at the top, we have a basic feed through for the power. On the bottom, we have thermocouple feed throughs. And on the side, we have a, uh, a liquid nitrogen uh, input. So these are all, again, very co common off the shelf parts. And it takes all these inputs and compactifies it in a way that can be just adapted to really any um, conflat based system, which is really the default standard for ultra high vacuum uh, test setups. So together, this is the whole shroud system with the inputs. Um, so this would be slid directly into the chamber over the propulsion system. Um, so you can see here, this is a cutaway of the propulsions or of, of the chamber with the uh, thermal vacuum uh, system in place. Um, so a little bit of a close up, you can actually see the, the thruster uh, inside of the thermal shroud. Uh, I actually have this thruster with me and I'll be giving a talk tomorrow uh, on my micro propulsion development for this particular thruster and I can pass it around and show it more. Um, so what's really powerful about this setup is it's extremely simple, it's extremely cost effective, I can do it in a very compact space and it also allows me to uh, fire the thruster while cycling it both hot and cold. Um, so this is actually a little pretty critical, um, not so much for this thruster, but if I get into more advanced fuels such as uh, liquid metal fuels for FEEP or um, room temperature molten salts for things like colloidal electrospray, uh, which I will be uh, eventually exploring. So the next system, this is a kind of personal project that goes way back before I started the uh, whole propulsion effort, uh, is Exceda. So this is an open source uh, high power pulsed accelerator. Um, this really goes beyond the open space community in that its uh, goal is to really um, bring a new level of high power particle physics to the amateur and maker community to a level that hasn't been uh, really done before. So every accelerator needs a cool acronym. Uh, so I came up with this one. Uh, it stands for Explosive Emission Diode Accelerator. So this particular accelerator is based off of an explosive electron emission, uh, intense relativistic beam, direct drive pulse diode accelerator. Uh, it's a huge mouthful. Um, but um, it's a very, very simple type of accelerator system. It's based off of a dielectric fiber uh, cold field emission plasma cathode. So essentially I'm just using a velvet cloth glued to a metal surface um, and driving it in a particular way to generate huge amounts of current. Um, so a nice thing about this accelerator is it's extremely low cost compared to other technologies and it's extraordinarily modular um, and scalable. So some advantages, again, it's very cheap. It's a very simple. Um, drivers for this were pioneered by J.C. Martin, um, who is the father of pulse power, uh, who could generate you know, gigawatt class systems using pretty much stuff from the hardware store. Uh, it's highly versatile. You can generate electron beams, ion beams, uh, flash x-rays, high power microwaves. You can use it for driving intense gas lasers. You can drive it, use it for driving free electron lasers. Um, and on the physics side, it will actually be covering designs uh, for the community for all of these types of systems as I go further. Um, so it's extremely scalable. You can drive it anywhere from uh, very low power 25 keV beams all the way up to several MeV um, tero terawatt class systems, which are the highest power accelerators uh, ever built. And uh, they have extremely low power requirements. Just power from your outlet um, can be uh, converted to megawatts or gigawatts of peak power due to pulse compression techniques used in pulse power. I don't have time to go over the actual generators um, to drive this system, but uh, they are actually surprisingly more simple than, than you would expect, and I can uh, talk about those details later if someone's interested. So this is actually the, the design of the accelerator. Um, so this is based on a six inch or CF100 uh, uh, conflat nipple section. Um, so inside you have the actual cathode stock. Uh, let's see. So this is the actual cathode stock. On the surface you have the velvet fiber emitter. Um, this screen in front is actually the anode, so it's about 82% uh, transparent, so that way you have uh, low beam losses uh, during the pulse. On the back side, you have the insulator stack, so this is a stack of uh, acrylic and aluminum plates uh, arranged in a particular manner to help shape the fields of the pulse, uh, um, so that way is it reduces uh, the probability of secondary electron emissions during the pulse off the um, 
insulator to prevent breakdown uh, during the huge peak pulses. And in the back, which you can't really see, um, there's a standard conflat based um, compression fitting that allows you to actually change the distance between the anode and the cathode. And by doing that, you can change the impedance of the system, which is extremely powerful for being able to optimize the system and match it for um, your pulse power driver. So you can use it for changing modes of operation and makes it extraordinarily versatile. So here are some basic beam parameters. Uh, electron beam energies I'm aiming for anywhere from 25 to 300 keV. Uh, the beam current is anywhere from hundreds of amps to over a kiloamp uh, due to the properties of the dielectric fiber. Um, the spot size is up to 55 millimeters for this design. Um, this is actually smaller than, than the first prototype I'm going to be building, which can support up to 80 millimeter beams, uh, which will actually be able to dose full sides of a pocket cube. Uh, X-ray energy is in the same range of the electrical input energy. If it's configured for heavier light or lighter heavy ion energies, um, you can get anywhere from 25 keV to up to 6 MeV uh, beams. Uh, the pulse width is several tens of nanoseconds. However, this can be driven up to several microseconds um, before you encounter problems such as impedance collapse. Uh, the peak beam power is about 300 megawatts. So this would be from about 9 gigawatts peak power that I'd be injecting into the driver. Um, the repetition rate is anywhere from single shot to less than 10 hertz, and that's determined based on the switching circuits as well as the vacuum pumping speed. Um, so again, the anode mesh transparency is about 82%, so I have about 18% beam loss, and then it's a variable impedance. So this is the accelerator actually attached to the micropropulsion chamber. Um, so cutaway, or uh, some applications, I guess, for, the space, for space systems, uh, you can do low energy electron beam dosing, so surface charging effects on things like solar panels, plastic structures, other, uh, just other structures in general. Uh, medium energy beams is where I'd be focusing from in the several ke hundred keV mark, uh, which we're starting to get into relativistic electron beam bombardment and a very high kilorad TID. So we're talking about many, many kilorads per shot. So this allows really um, uh, up to megarad level uh, dosing capabilities. Uh, then for, you can do uh, very intense uh, soft and hard x-ray dosing, and then if this were configured for protons, um, you can do anywhere from low to very high um, for uh, both uh, C events and TID. So a couple more slides. Uh, this is just kind of a conceptual design of what it would look like for the high TID direct beam dosing of the uh, propulsion system. So this is a beam line named Exceterados, so radiation dosing for space electronics. Um, so uh, one thing about these types of beams are it's very difficult to uh, transport these types of beams. You can't just fire it in vacuum. The beam would break up instantly. Uh, so there are methods like, uh, such as using simple plastic tubes uh, that allow for charge neutralization to be able to transport the beam at higher distances at, at lower energy losses. So I can pulse this a few times. I can you know, switch on the thruster, see how it works, and then you know, continue that. And then finally, um, this is a modified configuration for, for MEV dosing. So now we're getting into the range of uh, high energy MEV ions of several MEVs for looking at um, kind of C events. So this type of accelerator is actually uh, a forgotten technology now that I kind of want to revive. It's called a collective ion accelerator. So it's used to directly convert uh, the electron beam into high energy ions through passive means. Um, so no gas injection is actually used to, for the ions. The ions are actually stripped off of a plastic anode surface. Um, so due to um, physics effects that I can't really get into, now um, you can get very high passive energy gains from the initial input. So about 20 times the energy, the electron beam energy you can get out at the peak for, for um, ion energy. So if you have uh, hydrogen rich plastic such as um, acrylic, uh, you can get um, protons. If you use a Teflon uh, plate, you can get uh, carbon and fluorine atoms. Uh, so that's about it. Um, I post regularly on the website and on Twitter, and uh, this stuff is all brand new. You guys got all a uh, very special sneak preview at what's to come. Um, so uh, thank you for listening.
Thanks, Michael. That was brilliant. Um, before anyone else jumps in, can I ask a question first? Yeah. Um, what are the critical constraints and success factors in setting up those kinds of test setups? You know, if we wanted to try and do it, what are the things we really need to make sure we get right to get the results at the end? Um, you, you really, there's a lot, there's definitely a lot involved. You have to be really well versed in, spe in certain fields like pulse power and, and accelerator technologies, though the, the fundamental concepts are actually pretty simple. If I could get into the, the driver and stuff, you'd actually see that it's a, there's many ways of doing it very simply. And then there's just some very basic techniques for that, that you can use, like um, in order to know the energy of, of the beam you're producing, um, you can use um, calorimetry to, to determine that. And there's some um, very basic equations for doing that. You can use um, other very simple measurement methods to kind of to do that. So before I actually go into dosing, stuff. Um, if when I get to that stage after commissioning this and going through a whole bunch of checks, um, I would go through the qualifications of understanding the beam properties. Um, but really it comes down to just doing it in steps. Small baby steps first and really willing to get your hands dirty. Um, it's really something that you have to just do and play around with and tinker. Um. Calibrate it as you go along. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. This is super impressive research, so it's really, really cool to hear about. Um, so I'm trying to start designing for my club uh, TVAC testing. Yep. Um, but the primary concern is cost. Uh, so how much w money would it cost, and also how long would it take to recreate the kind of uh, TVAC chamber? You're Depends on how resourceful you are. Um, Really, really, it comes down to, again, how willing are you to actually get your hands dirty. Um, I've, I've mentored many students myself um, and many people. There's actually a whole um, high vacuum community all, all around the world, a vacuum hackers community. Um, so actually many members in Europe uh, who are doing um, high vacuum systems at home. Um, it's a very you know, kind of close-knit and awesome community. And they, they, they scrape by with, with almost nothing. Um, they, they, you, can, you can do a lot. But I'd, I'd say that really, when it comes to vacuum stuff, uh, you want to definitely do your research. Um, there's a lot of things, especially, that, that stop people in the beginning, um, particularly leaks. Um, you'd be surprised just how annoying it is to get a vacuum system to run without leaking like crazy. Uh, I'm fortunate that my system is very small. And I have a very high speed pump, so I can afford a lot of leaks. But I would definitely say, um, first and foremost, definitely do your research. Go through the v um, basics of vacuum engineering and um, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the technology. And don't do everything at once. If you start with a TVAC system, it's not going to work. You want to have your vacuum system working and fully functioning and qualified, and then add little things as you go. Um, in terms of cost, uh, I'm assuming you, you said it's through like a university effort. Um, so that act, you actually have an advantage that you might be able to work with other u universities and getting surplus parts or contacting companies to get you to donate and sponsor things. Um, again, the stuff, yeah, are, you, are you looking to do like a full cube sat or are you looking to do, um, so, so it really depends, I guess, um, what size hardware you're looking to do. And, and how big you're looking to, or, you know. Um, like for my chamber, it was a, I, I got a few hundred dollars surplus. Um, the whole thermal vacuum input setup would probably be new, uh, probably around $1,000 for, for that cross section with all the feed throughs. Um, so you can actually reasonably do uh, thermal vacuum, a small thermal vacuum setup um, pretty easily and cheaply, I'd say, for a few thousand dollars versus you know, these giant systems that if you were to get them from a company would cost you hundreds of thousands. Um, so if you want, you can, you know, email me and I'd be more than happen, ha happy to walk you through the process of design and um, some of the aspects of that. So I was told we have to be out here by five, but I don't know if this is a hard limit. Are they coming with sticks or? No, we're fine. We're we can fine. still, okay. Maybe one more question? Yeah, yeah I Does think there's some more. one more question on this? Yes, uh, so here and here. Well, my, my question is, uh, thank you. Uh, this is cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I see it's going to enable a lot of things. So um, I have a remark on the on the beam. Uh, are you planning also like to contain the beam with magnetic field? So uh, that's actually one of the interesting things about these beams is that 
Uh, normally, you would transport beams with magnetic fields, um, but due to the, the nature of this beam, uh, it's not efficient and doesn't really work. So I'll actually, in order to transport the beam, um, I'm using actually the, the plastic walls, which essentially um, the edges of the beam pass through, they strip away ions, and that helps generate um, kind of a self-magnetic field that, that contains and shields it um, as it passes through. Uh, so no magnetics are needed, really. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, what I wanted to ask is uh, how can we handle those, the power, con uh, how can we provide the needed power for this uh, uh, reactor, uh, reactor? Um, for this accelerator to work. Uh, I think, if I recall correctly, one slide said about for, uh, something about megawatts. Oh yeah, uh, so that's the beauty of pulse power. You can take, uh, you know, you, the outlet provides about one kilowatt. So pulse power works by taking power and compressing it in short vo um, time periods. So current is um, just um, the change of charge over the change of time. So if you have the same amount of charge in shorter time, your peak current increases, and then that means your peak power increases. So what pulse power does is takes, um, you know, a regular DC high voltage charging supply, you know, one kilowatt or less from the wall. You charge some sort of bank. Um, you, it can either be a simple capacitor bank or a Marx generator or something, and you fire that into another stage, um, which um, charges up in shorter time, and then you fire that in a shorter period, and that allows you to compress the pulse further and further. So um, you can generate you know, gigawatts of peak power in tens of nanoseconds with, you know, hundreds of watts from the wall. So it's actually very, very doable. Um, so don't be afraid by, you know, t megawatts and gigawatts at this level really means nothing because it's all about the time scale that you're firing it at. So for that little brief incident of time, um, you're able to generate and control massive quantities of power, but it's not as difficult as you would imagine. Like back to the right. future, the, the lightning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when he says 1.21 gigawatts, that's actually not that much for, for pulse power. I think uh, this is the last question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you, uh, do, is it required that you register in a national body uh, like an atomic commission to operate an accelerator? Um, if you're doing stuff officially, yes, uh, there is. <laughs> There, there actually, again, with the whole vacuum uh, community, there is a whole community of amateur particle accelerator builders. So there's a lot of people around the world who build cyclotrons. There's a lot of people around the world who build beam on target systems for neutron production. Um, this is all at home, and um, no one's actually done this particular type of accelerator before. This would be the first time that it would actually be home built. But there is actually a very wide community of home accelerator builders. Um, and I've never heard of anything that people would need any, the only time I, th I think I might have saw something about licensing is this guy who opened up his basement as kind of a, a, a learning lab for students. So he uh, officially having students coming in learning and using his facilities to do um, neutron studies, he kind of had to register. But other than that, kind of garage tinkerers, you don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not um, you know, an expert on this, but at least from being involved with the community, I not, I don't think there's any issues. It might depend on your country, too, but. Uh. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much.